Right, so hello and welcome back to Books and Things and welcome to another video. And today is my October wrap up. And for me, October was my Victober readathon, which I host with three other booktubers whose channels are linked down below. And so I read a lot of Victorian literature this month. So in the month of October I read 13 and a quarter books, one of those was for work so I can't talk about that, but the other 12 and a quarter books were all for Victober so I can talk about them here. I said in my vlog I think at the end of last week that I'd read 11 and a quarter books but I missed one out, I have actually read 12 and a bit. Um, so I'm feeling fairly pleased with that, I didn't get to everything on my TBR, I think there are four things on my TBR that I didn't start and one that I started and didn't finish the quarter book that I will be carrying on to with into November but I still feel like that's pretty good going um, and I read two things that weren't on my TBR as well. So yeah, I also did manage to complete all the challenges, though I did read by candlelight for about 15 minutes because I did not have enough candles for it to be um, very easy to see at all. Um, but there we go. Um, yeah, so let's get into the books. The only thing I read for Victoria that wasn't fiction was this. This is the diaries of Hannah Colwick. So Hannah Colwick was a maid servant during the Victorian period and she wrote extensive diaries throughout her life and this is like an edited selection of her diary entries. This was fascinating. Hannah Colwick is a really really interesting person. Her diaries are really interesting to read both because they give you a fascinating insight into what it was like to be a servant in the Victorian period, what it was like to live your everyday life in the Victorian period and to work for people um, and and how it was very different to work in sort of different households. But also Hannah was a fascinating woman. She had this really long relationship with a man who was upper class um, over a long period of time. They married later on in life but they were sort of a couple but secretly for about 18 years before they got married and then after they got married she lived with him as his servant and no one knew they were married um, but mostly through her choice because she liked working and she liked the independence that that gave her so she's a really really interesting person I'd love to read like a biography of her or more analysis of her diaries because they were absolutely fascinating and one of the things I found really interesting in this is not just the way it kind of looks at the work that servants did but also like the relationship that Hannah had with various people she served and she records a lot of conversations that she has with people she's serving in these diaries so this was absolutely fascinating I'd really recommend it if you're interested in the Victorian period um, and in kind of class relations and gender and like power dynamics in the Victorian period it's just fascinating yeah this is a really good read I'm glad I finally got around to it one of the first things I read this month was Flatland by Edwin Abbott and um, this was a weird one and I didn't especially enjoy it I don't really quite know what to make of it so um, the premise of Flatland is that it is about a place called Flatland which is flat and people are shapes and or lines well women are lines and men are triangles or squares or pentagons and the more sides they have the higher class they are um, and it basically it doesn't really have a story this book it's more just a kind of description of this square living in flatland and his life um, and what happens when he meets someone from um space land i think is what he calls um our 3d world and also what happens when he goes to like line land which is all 1d there are two issues i have with this i think that meant i didn't really love it one is that i just don't think it's well thought out like it doesn't make any sense and the way their society is set up makes it seem like it's a society that's set up that has like writing and a written language and like art and culture but they're squares or lines so how can they do anything and how their everyday lives work is not explored how their societies work is not really explored um, and there are lots of things that are the same as our world which definitely wouldn't be the same in a world that is 2d so i didn't think that worked i also struggled with the gender stuff in this so women are lines men are squares and women in flatland are basically considered stupid and like a subspecies they're not considered to be fully, I mean not human because they're not human, but they're not considered to be on the same level in any way as the males and they're sort of treated very very badly and looked down upon very much by everyone. There has been some critical writing that Enwin Abbott is trying to like parody the gender roles in Victorian society to make a point about how, how unequal they are but it doesn't feel like that to me reading it, it just feels very sexist and well maybe not misogynistic, I don't think it's a book that comes across as hating women, it's a book that comes across as thinking women are stupid. And I was thinking before about like treating classics as of their time very much but I feel like this is much worse than most things of its time and I don't know if that is because it's trying to be satirical or if it's just really sexist um, but either way I didn't enjoy that so 
Another slightly old one I read this month was News From Nowhere by William Morris, which is William Morris's socialist utopian novel where a man from the Victorian period wakes up one day um, in the year 2102, I think, um, in a socialist utopia where everything seems to be perfect, there's no money, um, everyone just kind of does the work that they want to do. It's a very, like, arts and crafts, um, handicrafts, making things with your hands kind of socialist utopia, which is really interesting and makes a lot of sense of being written by William Morris, who, if you don't know, is a very important figure in the arts and crafts movement and a really incredible designer. One of the reasons why I wanted to read this is because I love William Morris's like design work and his wallpaper and his art. Like, I just think he was an incredible artist. And in this socialist utopia, a lot of people seem to be very, very happy. Um, certain social institutions from the Victorian period have been like abolished, so marriage and divorce are much kind of freer, people are much freer in their relationships. Um, everyone is now very, very beautiful, especially the women. There's a big focus on how much more beautiful and young looking all of the women are in the future, which annoyed me slightly. That's the kind of like Victorian gender stuff, which I find frustrating, but I don't find like makes me want to put the book down like in Flatland. Anyway, um, yeah, so there were lots of things about this that I found really, really interesting. But I think I would say this is one of those works that I found more interesting than I found enjoyable. Like, I would have very happily read an essay or a non-fiction book about William Morris's idea of what the future would look like. I think that would have been fascinating, but this isn't quite a novel. Like, there isn't really a plot and the main character doesn't really have a character, which is kind of the point. But it's set up like a novel and then this person who's been transported from the Victorian period to the future never like thinks about am I is he ever going to get back to the Victorian period does he want to get back to the Victorian period is he ever going to see all the people he left behind again like there's none of that which I, I get is kind of not the point of this book um but its absence of plot and characterization I found meant I didn't super love it but it was a really interesting read and interesting to kind of see what William Morris's vision of the future was. And on to some Rudyard Kipling. Um, I actually read two things by Rudyard Kipling this month. One was The Light That Failed. This is his first novel, I believe, um, and it follows the life of an artist and his sort of unrequited love with a childhood friend of his, and also looks at what happens as his eyesight starts to fail and the effect that that has on him um, and his kind of sense of identity as an artist. There were some things about this that I really liked. I loved the first half. I thought it was really well written, really engaging. It really reminded me of sort of reading a H.G. Wells realist novel or a Gissing. I think partly because like Gissing and some of H.G. Wells realist novels, it looks at kind of people who are sort of hovering between the lower and middle classes um, in the 1890s who are struggling with poverty and, and the complexities of romantic relationships. Um, and I really thought that was fascinating. But I found the ending really disappointing and bizarrely enough there were actually two endings to this because Rudyard Kipling wrote a short version and then he wasn't happy with the ending and he wrote a longer version later which ends at a different point. But I don't like either endings. Um, neither of the endings really worked for me um, and I thought that was a shame and I felt that there was something else that could have been done here which would have made this a better book. I don't know, I always, I've read several things by Kipling now and I always love his writing but I never come away from his books being like this was a five star read. I always come away being like this was like a 3.5 star read. Um, Kim was probably a four star read for me but even then there were things about it that didn't like do everything I wanted them to do. I don't know. I wonder if he's like a better writer in terms of his like phrasing and writing than he is in terms of his plots. I don't know. And um, the other thing I read by Roger Kipling was this. This is a collection of short stories of his. This wasn't on my TBR but I just bought it this month and thought I would give it a read. Um, and this has several short stories in, um, most of which are set in India and elsewhere, not in England as The Light That Failed is. I found these stories interesting. I think the second story, uh, False Dawn in particular, I enjoyed. But again, like a lot of Kipling, I really enjoyed the writing and didn't quite get the like emotional impact from it, from the story. So yeah, but there we go. Still a nice little short read for Victoria. This month, I also read quite a few things by Oscar Wilde. So I reread the two plays we were doing for our group read-alongs, A Woman of No Importance and um, The Importance of Being Earnest, both of which I really enjoyed. So The Importance of Being Earnest follows um, two men, Jack and Algernon, who for various reasons pretend that their name is Ernest, um, and it follows their like romantic relationships. It is basically a, a Victorian rom-com, I suppose, in some ways. It's really, really good fun, and I really enjoy it. A Woman of No Importance is a little bit more serious, though it's very funny as well, and it follows the relationship between a mother and her son, who's sort of just 
on the verge of becoming an adult um, and what happens when he gets mixed up in some people from her past that she doesn't want him to know. I love both of these plays a lot. Um, the importance of being earnest is very very funny and witty and I really really enjoy it. Um, but Women of No Importance is my favourite play by Oscar Wilde. It's one of my favourite plays of all time. I love it for its exploration of um, gender power dynamics in the Victorian period and for its look at kind of double standards in the era. I think it's a fantastic play and I really really love it. The last scene, the last line especially, I just, oh it just makes me so like, oh I love it, it's so good. Um, so yeah, I know a lot of people really enjoyed reading these two as well and um, I know a lot of people preferred The Importance of Being Earnest to A Woman of No Importance. I think I'm in a slight minority there but I really do think A Woman of No Importance is one of Oscar Wilde's greatest works. It's just It's just so cool and proto-feminist and exciting and the characterization and the writing and the dialogue, I just love it. Oscar Wilde is such a fantastic writer. And then I also reread The Picture of Dorian Gray. Me and my fiance Nick listened to this together on audiobook. Um, we made a video about it, discussing it together, so I will link that down below as well if you want to go and have a watch. Really enjoyed listening to this on audiobook. Um, again, it's been about six years since I last read it and I love it a lot. It's a fantastic book. We follow a young man called Dorian Gray. And at the start of the book, a painter friend of his, Basil Holwood, paints this beautiful portrait of him. And Dorian wishes with all his heart that it could be the portrait that would age and he would stay young and beautiful and innocent forever. And that wish comes true and Dorian stays looking young and beautiful and innocent. And the portrait look, starts to look older and also starts to look more corrupt and evil as Dorian starts to become a little bit more corrupt himself. It's a really fantastic book, so engaging, it's so witty and yeah, really powerful. I love it a lot. Me and Nick discussed it for about 40 minutes in the video we did together, so if you want a long and spoilery review I will link that down below. I'm coming in the second half of this video to all of my longer reads from the month actually. I think most of the ones I've spoken about so far have been quite short. But the next four and a quarter books um, are all pretty long ones. So one was The American Senator by Anthony Trollope. I think this is just over 500 pages. Yeah, 550. Um, this is a fantastic Trollope book. I really, really enjoyed it. I love Anthony Trollope. He's one of my favourite writers this year. I have been reading a book a month by Anthony Trollope, which has been really good fun. And this has been one of my favourites that I've read this year. This follows um, various characters all set around one that's kind of smallish town. Um, we follow kind of two heroines, a young woman called Mary who is very likeable and a young woman called Arabella who is not so immediately likeable but you do kind of understand and we follow their sort of romantic relationships. Mary is in love with someone who she doesn't think she has any hope with and who she is not trying to marry and Arabella is trying to marry someone who she is not in love with because she wants to get married and have a position in the world. We also have the American Senator of the title who is not the major character. I do not know, really know why this book is called The American Senator. In fact, Anthony Trollope makes a joke at the very end of the book um, saying that it would have been better off called something else um, which made me laugh but the American senator um, is visiting the man that Arabella is trying to marry um, and he kind of makes many observations on the world as he sees it around him and is kind of quite confused by English society in many ways which is something in this book that I really enjoyed so yeah I, I really enjoyed this a lot I think it's a really fantastic Trollope some really interesting plots and kind of does what Trollope does well in terms of its social criticism um, and its examination of the position of women in Victorian society especially and uh, the way it looks at class and so on just yeah really fantastic book would highly recommend then I also read John Halifax Gentleman by Diana Mullet Crake this was a really interesting one I read Olive by her last year and it has been one of my favourite books of the last five years. Um, John Halifax I didn't love quite as much but I did still really enjoy it. It was still a fantastic book. And we follow the, our narrator Phineas from his boyhood into his kind of late middle age. The book spans about um, 40 to 45 years I would say and, and we follow Phineas's relationship with a boy called John Halifax um, and they become really close friends when they are sort of in their teenage years and go on to become close friends throughout their life well into their adulthood and beyond. It's a really fascinating book. I love the way it spans such a long period of time and follows these men's lives and their relationship with each other over a really long period of time. I also like the fact that it's kind of it's told from Phineas's perspective but the book is about John Halifax like Phineas is not really the main character even though he is our narrator and he's the one who shows us the story um, so I thought that was quite cleverly done as well. I also like there are so many fant fantastic themes that are dealt with so well than here. The exploration of class and like social position in this book is fantastic. The book is called John Halifax Gentleman obviously 
but when he first meets John Halifax, John Halifax is um, a sort of 14 year old boy who's starving, who's an orphan, who has no home. And we kind of follow the course of his life. I also love the way this book looks at love is really powerful. The way this book looks at family and parenthood and um, grief. Like there are so many things in this book that are done so well. Phineas also has a disability and the way this is dealt with especially in the kind of early parts of his life is really really interesting. I also found the relationship between Phineas and John really fascinating because I think in some ways Phineas's attachment to John is quite like romanticised um, and I enjoyed that because I'm always interested in that. I've spoken before about how I find in Victorian literature the connection between um, disability and homosexuality really really interesting because actually a lot of the characters in Victorian literature who have very romanticised attachments to people of the same gender as them are characters with disabilities so that was really interesting to look at in this book as well. Um, I will link down below videos that I have done on disability in Victorian literature and like LGBT plus undertones in Victorian literature. I'll link them down below in the description. Um, John Halifax would have fitted nicely into both of those videos had I read it back then. Yeah I really really enjoyed this book it was really fantastic a great audiobook too really really powerful like several bits moved me to tears um I love Dada Mullet Craig a lot looking forward to reading even more by her in the future I don't actually know how many books she's written so I'm gonna have to look that up and find out because she's just amazing and yeah this was a great book. I also really enjoyed Alec Forbes of How Glen by George MacDonald. This is a Scottish Victorian book um, which follows the lives of two people, Alec Forbes, our title character, and a girl called Annie Anderson. In a way I would actually say that Annie is the main character more than Alec. Like I felt like she was the focal point of the story for me, though a lot of it is a dual narrative flitting between them both. And Annie and Alec are kind of friends at school from their childhood and then kind of go their separate ways in later life. He is from a sort of social position slightly above her. She is an orphan and she's treated very badly by the relatives who take her in and kind of use her money without telling her that she has any money of her own um, and there's a lot in this book that I really really love there are some wonderful characters in here particularly one man um, who is the librarian of the college that Alex later goes to who is an alcoholic and I thought the way that was dealt with was fantastic and he was one of my favorite characters he was so well done and several of the other characters that Annie kind of befriends over the course of her life were really really interesting I think the way this book looks at class and kind of unrequited love and growing up it's a fantastic Bildung's Roman. It felt quite Dickensian in many places to me which I really enjoyed, a kind of good Scottish Dickens. One thing I will say there was one bit in like the three quarter mark or something which I didn't really love which I would have been I would have liked to have been done slightly differently and um, so that was why I think it took it down from like a five star to a four star to me because I did so much enjoy it but another thing I will say um, if you're looking into reading this one is that um, the dialogue is all written in very heavy Scottish dialects and I am better with Scottish dialect than I am with any other written dialect because um, I'm half Scottish, a lot of my family is Scottish so I know a lot more Scottish slang and a lot more Scottish pronunciation and also my grandparents used to give me um, Scottish comic books like Oh Willie and the Bruins when I was a kid and they're all written in dialect so I'm kind of like vaguely familiar with reading Scottish dialect but it is still, it's quite heavy dialect and it's pretty much all of the dialogue and I did slightly struggle with that though I got into it more as I got through it but if you're not comfortable reading that I do think it's worth being wary of that and I do think the next time I read a George MacDonald I might try and get an audiobook because um, I did slightly struggle. It certainly slowed down my reading pace I think and there were probably yeah a fair few sentences where I slightly lost the thread of what was being said but still a really great read and one I really enjoyed. One of my absolute favourite books of the month, probably my favourite like new read rather than reread of the month was Deerbrook by Harriet Martineau. This is a book that Kate Howard recommended to me a while ago when she read it and I've been meaning to read it for ages and it was fantastic. We follow two sisters who newly moved to the town of Deerbrook at the beginning of the book and we follow their romantic relationships and their relationship with each other and their relationships with everyone else in the town. It is very much a novel about small towns and about the difficulty of living in a small town especially where there is kind of gossip and bad feeling. There's one woman in particular who takes against these two young women um, and kind of manages to ruin their lives in so many ways um, and the kind of poisonous nature of gossip in small towns is just 
explored fantastically in Deerbrook. It's wonderful. It reminded me of Thomas Hardy a lot and it also reminded me slightly of Elizabeth Gaskell. Like a fantastic Thomas Hardy Elizabeth Gaskell mashup in the best way. It was so good and so powerful. There were so many bits that moved me to tears or so many bits that had me like on the edge of my seat. It was so good and like the characterization, the exploration of kind of unrequited love, of marriage, of family, grief and reputation and poverty and like sisterhood was fantastic but as well as all of the like emotions it was also so dramatic and exciting like I just I really really can't recommend Deerbrook enough that's my highlight of this Victober that's my new discovery last year was Olive by Diana Miller Craig this year is Deerbrook don't love it quite as much as I love Olive but I love it a lot and I'm so excited to read more by this author in the future because I haven't read anything by her before and it was amazing now finally my quarter book. I am a quarter of the way through rereading Dombey and Son by Charles Dickens on audiobook. And while Deerbrook is my new discover highlight, this is my other highlight, my real, my true highlight. I just, it's been a long time since I read Dickens just for fun. Like the last three Dickens books I have read, two were for my Dickens serialised read along. So I was reading them four chapters a month over 18 months really really slowly and also I was reading making lots of notes and reading it like specifically for the purpose of making videos about those chapters um, and I also read Great Expectations which was for another video for one of my like when I was doing the hypothetical Victorian literature course videos I did one on Great Expectations so again I read it making a lot of notes um, and read it with the purpose of making a video about it. And then I think the two Dickens is I reread most recently before those three, which were also many rereads, um, were Barnaby Rudge and Oliver Twist, which are two of my lesser favourite Dickens. And before that, the last time I reread a lot of Dickens was when I was at university, when I was reading them for my dissertation. So like the last time I read one of my favourite Dickens, purely for fun and not for a purpose, was years ago. Um, and I just have been loving rereading this because it's it's my second favourite Dickens book, one of my favourite books of all time, definitely in my top five, probably in my top three. I can't remember where I put it in my favourites week, but maybe it should be number three rather than number four. I can't remember, but I just, I love this book a lot. And I also haven't listened to a Dickens on audiobook for years, like for a good seven years, I think. I don't think I've listened to a Dickens on audiobook. And like Dickens works so well read aloud because his books are written to be read aloud. And when you listen to them on audiobook, especially a well done audiobook, like the one I'm listening to, the one I'm listening to is the um, Dickens collection on Audible one, which is narrated by Owen Teal. And it is fantastically done. His voices, all the characters are so good. I just, there's just few things as good as listening to a Dickens book. And this is one of the best. Um, so I should explain what this book is about before I just get really excited about Dickens. Dombey and Son at his heart is not about Mr. Dombey and not about his son. It is about Mr. Dombey's daughter. So Dombey and Son follows this family, the Dombeys. Mr. Dombey is obsessed with his company, Dombey and Son, and he is incredibly excited at the beginning of this book when his son is born, because all he has ever wanted is a son to share his company with. But he also has a daughter who's six years old, and he doesn't care about his daughter at all because she is a girl, and so she can't run on the business, and girls for Mr. Dombey are unimportant. So we follow this girl, Florence Dombey, who is neglected entirely by her father, um, who is shut out of her family in so many ways. And we follow her life over the course of this book. And it is fantastic. There are so many amazing things in this book. The way this book looks at gender, is amazing. The way this book looks at Victorian ideas of masculinity and femininity, the way this book looks at marriage and grief and money and class, like this book is just amazing. Um, and the gender stuff in this book is like Dickens at his best. Um, when I wrote my dissertation on Charles Dickens at university, um, I wrote a lot about Dombey and Son along with six other Dickens books, as you do. And one of the like critical books I read for my dissertation, which was on gender in Dickens, um, talked about how in the character of Edith in Dombey and Son, who I haven't got to yet in my reread and I'm so excited to get to, you see like for the first time chronologically through his works, you see like a feminist Dickens emerge and I think it's true and I think it's so exciting and I'm so excited for Edith to appear in my listening. Anyway, I'm about a quarter of the way through, I'm 12 hours into a 41 hour audiobook so it's gonna take me a while, I might finish it in November, I might finish it in December, I don't know, but I'm just loving rereading this book because I had forgotten how much I loved Dickens in a way. I mean, I haven't because I go on about it a lot, but like 
because I haven't read Dickens just for pure sheer love and not with the like intention of making an analytical video about it for ages, it was just so lovely to, it's just been so lovely to reread a Dickens in just like, for, for absolute fun. Um, which is why I'm no longer doing the Victorian serialised read-alongs, because while I have been excited in those videos, I feel like I'm so excited now and I'm just, I'm just really loving rereading Don Moon's Son because it's so good. It's one of his best. I could go on for like another 10 minutes, so I'm not going to do that. But suffice to say, my new highlight of Victober is Deerbrook and my reread highlight of Victober is Don Moon's Son, even though I'm only a quarter of the way through because this book, yeah. I mean, it's, I love our mutual friend more, but it's 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 not it's not that there's not that big a difference thank you so much for watching thank you if you participated in victober um like i said in my um final vlog it's been so exciting to see how many people have taken part this year like on booktube on twitter on bookstagram on goodreads like so many people have taken part this year and that is incredibly exciting i've had a really great time and i hope you guys have too so let me know down in the comments did you take part in victober what was your highlight and yeah that is it for today thank you very much for watching what i'm sure was quite a long video i am gonna take a week off booktube so there won't be any other videos this week and my next video will be up a week from today and next monday just because there was a lot of content in victober um, and i need some time to film some more um so yeah that's it for today thank you so much for watching and i'll be back very soon with another bookish video